Charles II was the eldest surviving son of King Charles I and Queen Henrietta. When Cromwell defeated and beheaded his father, Charles II was forced to flee England in disguise with a bounty on his head and the risk of death for anyone caught helping him. For nine years, Charles moved around the lowland countries of Europe, primarily in France and the Netherlands, seeking assistance where he could find it and planning his return home and the restoration of the monarchy. With the death of Oliver Cromwell in 1658 and the failure of Cromwell's son to maintain the Republic, Charles was called back to reclaim his crown and rule Britain as its king in 1660. Following the sternness and repression of Cromwell's puritanical rule, Charles's restoration was initially met with widespread enthusiasm, which eventually faded into disappointment and disillusion. Charles's vices had flourished while in exile and were fully indulged once he restored the monarchy. Popularly known as the Merry Monarch, King Charles II, a lovable rogue, failed to produce a legitimate heir by his wife Catherine, while begetting at least 12 illegitimate children by various mistresses. His reign was marked by hedonism and sensuality to an extreme degree. As a ruler, his neglect of national interest, lack of ideological commitment, and reliance on selfish and incompetent advisors produced a mediocre reign. Charles II died in 1685 at age 54, passing the crown to his brother, James II. With this brief introduction, let's consider the reincarnational profile of this individual as provided by Edgar Cayce. A single life reading was given for a 30-year-old mortgage broker on December 17, 1930. The portion of the reading that addressed the past life as Charles II mentioned the divisions in the land and beheading of the ruler that defined that period. Thus Charles came to be exiled in a strange land and among people who influenced him in a manner that made for a life of less purposefulness than he had intended for himself. His reading goes on to declare that as a soul entity, he really was of sterner stuff than he showed to the people during that experience. He gained little, becoming timid in the latter portion of that sojourn. Yet in determination, binding self to duty, even under the stress and strain of those who counseled him, he endured. Certainly he did turn more to the material and social side of life, gaining through the greater experiences of that period by the contact with others, but too often losing by succumbing to those who had their own axes to grind. Thus the reading for this man parallels pretty closely what we know of Charles II from the historical record. There were at least 31 individuals who received readings that indicated a past life connection to Charles II. But other than his mother, Queen Henrietta, none were famous or particularly noteworthy as historical figures. Only two were English, all the rest were apparently French who supported Charles during his exile. Many were disappointed by Charles due to broken promises, several of which were women who felt neglected by the young king once he had achieved his objectives. For example, a reading for a 21-year-old woman described a past life as Mademoiselle Arcelles, who lived in France when Charles was in exile there. She became an associate and companion to Charles, and like many others, was disappointed when he was recalled to England. She carried over into her modern life a belief in the insincerity of men, distrusting almost all, but emotionally drawn to the circumstances of that French incarnation. In terms of soul development, she gained and lost, losing mostly by succumbing to a don't care attitude. Her reading told her to avoid that pitfall in her modern life by recognizing that whatever she experiences in life is for her own development, if met with a positive attitude. A reading for an 18-day-old baby girl described a past life in France as Undine, one of Charles's disappointed lovers. 
The parents of this baby who received the reading were warned to take care as the child developed, for there would be an innate attraction for those of the opposite sex in positions of power. This tendency would begin to be expressed when the girl was 10 to 13 years of age. The past life influence could manifest as disappointments that bring little spites, little hates, temper tantrums that could become violent, as was the case in that French incarnation. However, not all of Charles's disappointed lovers came to naught. A reading for a 50-year-old woman described a past life in France as a dare. Adair was a companion of Charles that lost confidence in men from her experiences with that young ruler. Yet she gained from the experience and carried forward into her modern incarnation the ability to use any situation or experience as a stepping stone, seldom acknowledging defeat regardless of circumstances. Another example of a woman who overcame disappointment in Charles is found in a reading for a 22-year-old college student. In that past life as Charmin, who lived in France during the exile of Charles II, she provided aid and support to Charles and others in that association, gaining through that experience. Even though she was treated badly by Charles, she did not hold malice or thought of being mistreated, which brought to her the help of others and soul development throughout that period. And certainly not all of those disappointed with Charles were women. A reading for a 30-year-old man described a past life as Charlene, a friend and associate to Charles II, both in France during his exile and in England upon his restoration as king. He fell out with Charles when so many ladies gained the attention of the king. While initially holding a grudge that brought destructive forces, later in that sojourn, Charlin developed a more spiritual focus while becoming a friend and associate of the king's brother, James II. This individual carried over into his modern life an ability to be a good conversationalist and socializer, feeling an affinity for those of royalty, yet innately a dislike for those who would lord over another. As a practical matter, during Charles's exile abroad, he did have to take care to avoid spies and agents of Cromwell who might bring harm or cause him problems. In addition to the limited support he gained from the French royalty, who were trying to maintain stable diplomatic relations with Cromwell, Charles apparently had access to a network of supporters who at times provided safe houses and shelter. For example, a reading for a 39-year-old woman described a past life in France as Rula, a member of a household where Charles II was kept hid for a period when he was in exile. Spiritually, Rula gained through the assistance that she provided, but lost through self-indulgence. In her modern life, she often had an innate feeling that she had experienced the glory and pomp associated with royalty, which also resonated with another lifetime in ancient Egypt, where she was a princess in the household of a king. A reading for a 45-year-old woman described a past life in France as Asada, in a household where Charles II was sheltered to prevent his capture by soldiers. Asada was a favorite of Charles and eventually traveled to England. In her modern life, she carried over particular preferences in clothing and the ability to keep secrets. Interestingly, within Asada's French household, there lived a woman named Lurleen, who also assisted Charles in his return to England. Lurleen was said to have been a past life of Edgar Cayce's wife, Gertrude, who curiously reported having a beloved childhood doll named Lurleen, which she could not explain since she had never known anyone by that name. From that French sojourn as Lurleen, Mrs. Casey also had an innate love of the finer, more beautiful things in life, and of playing the courtesan to many. Certainly there were a few readings for individuals who were said to have been associated with Charles II after his return and restoration, a self-indulgent courtier a loyal guard who kept secrets in confidence, a political counselor at court who became a freelance soldier of fortune when Charles forgot all about him. Just the sort of stories that litter the historical record for this monarch. 
And yet it is very curious indeed that the readings for Charles II and his associates tend to focus so heavily on the period of his exile abroad. This apparent anomaly may actually provide some clues about Edgar Cayce's psychic process and the role of soul groups in reincarnational patterns. Perhaps the reason for the strong emphasis on French incarnations in the case of Charles II is connected in some manner to a broader pattern of incarnations in that place and time. For there are many influential past lives detailed in Casey's life readings for French royalty in that lifetime, including King Louis the 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th, with Marie Antoinette and at least 17 individuals who participated in the French Revolution. It would almost seem as if there was a reincarnational magnet in 17th and 18th century France for the soul group who sought readings from Edgar Cayce in the 20th century. And there is a fascinating connection with King James II, the younger brother of Charles II, who was in exile with Charles, returned to England as the Duke of York, and succeeded Charles as king in his own right. For the Casey readings insist that James II bore an illegitimate son by a French princess. The princess was a past life of Edgar Casey's personal secretary, Gladys Davis. The royal love child was Edgar Casey himself, who was murdered at age five in a dark tale of court intrigue that is covered in another project in this series on reincarnational history.